Hi guys and welcome to the summary of antimicrobials and anti-infective drugs. My name is Libas Periki and I'm a third year nursing student and I'm the pharmacology tutor. Please note that I'm just going to be giving you a summary of the topic and not going to be going into a lot of detail. I'm just going to be highlighting the most important things that you need to know on these topics. So in addition to this voiceover, I've attached um, a scanned copy of my notes so you can print those so long and follow with me as I'm going to be going through the notes. Okay, let's get into it. So first of all, we need to know what antimicrobials. So antimicrobials is any drug or an agent that is used to combat. So it's used to either kill or immobilize a microorganism and may either be synthetic chemotherapeutics. So synthetic chemotherapeutics, synthetic means it's made in a lab and chemotherapeutics is anything that can kill or immobilize a microorganism. So these drugs can either be synthetic, meaning they're made in a lab, or they can be antibiotics. So where antibiotics, they are made using, um, what do you call it, natural organisms like bacteria. So for example, penicillin was made using a fungus. So there's different classes of antimicrobials. So we have antibacterials, which kill or immobilize bacterial infections. And then we've got antivirals that kill viral infections. And then we've got antifungals, which kill or immobilize fungal infections. And then we've got antiprotozoals, which kill protozoal infections. So all these different classes, we're going to be speaking about them um, under antimicrobials, and I'm going to be covering them today. So, what is an antibiotic? So, antibiotic is any chemical that is produced by a microorganism and is in low concentration and therefore is capable of killing or inhibiting the growth of other microorganisms. So, it's pretty much a microorganism like a fungus that is taken in a low concentration and it is capable of killing another microorganism. So it's pretty much a prey and predator type of relationship. So for example, Alexandra Fleming, um, he was a bit disorderly in his work and one day he left a badge or a culture plate of Staphylococcus bacteria and it was uncovered and there happened to be a fungus which is known as penicillin notatatum which had contaminated the staphylococcus bacteria and killed it and that's how it discovered penicillin so the microorganism penicillin notatatum killed another microorganism which is staphylococcus bacteria so it's pretty much different microorganisms killing one another so these micro these antibiotics, they are modified chemically to enable them to be used orally because if they're not modified, they would cause harm to our trachea, to our esophagus and all of that. So obviously you need to avoid those effects. And then it's also modified to inhibit it from development of resistance. So you may have to make sure that it's as strong as possible to kill the bacteria because if it does not kill it effectively, it will create resistance, but I'll speak about that later on. And then it also ensures that there's a broad spectrum of effectiveness. So I'll speak about the spectrum later on. So antibiotics can be two different types. We've got bacteriostatic, meaning they inhibit the bacterial growth. They just stop it from spreading and growing further, but it does not kill it. So that means it will still be in your body. So should you experience a phase in your life where you've got a suppressed immune system, that bacteria can actually now start creating problems because it's still in your body. And then we've got antibiotics that are bacteriocidal. They actually physically kill the bacteria. And good examples of this is aminoglycosides and vancomycin. So, with regards to spectrum, so a spectrum of an antibiotic it just gives an indication of the number of types of microorganisms that are sensitive to its action. So, if an antibiotic is a broad spectrum, meaning it's effective against 
a large number of bacteria. I'll give you examples of the different bacteria that antibiotics can cover. And then if it's narrow spectrum, it means it's only a, capable of killing a few strains of bacteria. Obviously, when you're treating a medication, um, illness you want to use a narrow spectrum as much as possible because that will give you the least side effects because broad spectrum if it kills a different number of um, bacteria in your body your body naturally has a flora of bacteria so if you're killing a multiple of it it can actually create other problems and that sort of thing and please note that antibiotics are not effective against viruses Please know that they're not effective against viruses and only work against bacteria. Okay, so when choosing an antibiotic, you there's different things that you need to look at. So first of all, antibiotics have different spectrums of activity as we've already noted. So when you're choosing the antibiotic, you need to know what type of organism that you're going to kill and if the antibiotic is able to kill that because you can give a narrow spectrum antibiotic but if it does not cover that bacteria that you're trying to kill the antibiotic will not work and then also you want to look at the patient's history of allergies because if the patient is allergic to a certain antibiotic you cannot use it because it will just create more harm to the patient than anything and i've already mentioned about using the narrow antibiotic so let's say a patient comes into the hospital this will mostly happen in a clinic setting because in a hospital they are triaged by the medical doctor so you guys actually get patients once you already know what is happening with them but in a clinic a patient will come in they've got a bacterial infection somewhere on their body and you have to treat them at that point in time because obviously it's causing discomfort and that sort of thing but you haven't done a bacterial identification test so a bacterial identification test is pretty much just taking a part of skin of your body saliva or just anything on your body where the infection is to try to identify what type of bacteria it is so if you have not done this you can just look at the body so the body has normal bacteria that either lives on it or lives in it and these are all in balance or in homeostasis with one another and they do not cause any harm to you they only cause harm should you be immunosuppressed or if there's trauma that happens to you so if someone comes in and they've got a bacterial infection on the skin you can look at on the skin right here the different bacteria that stay on the skin is the most important one that you have to know is staphylococcus that one they mention it everywhere and then you've got trichosporin you've got pyrosporin and all of that so when you choose the antibiotic without having done the identification test you can see okay this antibiotic is able to kill staphylococcus or these number of bacteria on the skin therefore i can give this antibiotic without having done the identification test okay so antibiotic resistance is when the antibiotic is not effective in either killing or inhibiting the growth of the bacteria it is used to kill or inhibit this happens when the bacterium acquires new dna that causes it to produce proteins that confers resistance to antibiotic action so pretty much what this is saying is sometimes when we're using antibiotics and you don't take it for as long as it is prescribed or the full treatment is not done as a result the bacteria realizes okay you want to kill me with this antibiotic but you haven't given either a right amount of dosage or you haven't taken it for a long enough time as prescribed it can actually use the antibiotic to create new proteins that can help it to fight against that antibiotic so should you be given that antibiotic again the bacteria will know how to fight that antibiotic and as a result would actually end up not being effective so that is why it is very very important to not just give patients antibiotics unnecessarily especially when they're complaining of flu or colds because those are viruses and antibiotics don't work and should someone be taking antibiotic they need to 
finish their course even if they are feeling much better because most antibiotic courses are for seven days so if by day five they are feeling better and they don't want to take the antibiotic anymore when you're giving your patient health education during discharge you need to tell them to finish the antibiotics because you want to avoid creating resistance because another issue that can result is if someone has now received an antibiotic resistance and they infect someone else, that person that has been infected will have the resistant bacteria in their body. And as a result, they will have what is known as a super infection, I guess you can say. So if that person now that has been infected is given the antibiotic that treats that bacteria, since they already have resistance, that antibiotic that they're given will not work. So it's very important to avoid spreading resistant bacteria around pretty much what you can call mutants of bacteria. Okay, so... Super infection, prebiotic, and probiotic. These are very important terms that you need to know. They usually throw them during multiple choice. So a super infection is a new infection in addition to the one that is already present. So this occurs when the normal flora that we naturally have in our body is substantially decreased by the use of antibiotics. And this is usually when you use broad spectrum antibiotics because they kill a whole range of bacteria and as a result it decreases the normal flora of your body and pretty much puts your body out of homeostasis and as a result this allows opportunistic organisms to invade your body so pretty much you end up having double infections and then a prebiotic the first line here you can read for yourself that's the definition that they will use when they give it in a test but for you to understand what a prebiotic is, it's a type of dietary fiber that feeds on the friendly bacteria in your body. And this helps the gut bacteria produce nutrients that your colon cells need and leads to a healthier digestive system. And as a result, this prevents issues such as um, constipation. You can also prevent some colon cancers because there's regular movement in your digestive system. It resists absorption in the upper small intestine and eggs predominantly in the colon. So it pretty much just cleans out your system. So these are usually very important after you've had an antibiotic uh, treatment to just replenish the bacteria that has been killed by the antibiotics. And then what is known as a probiotic, this is a dietary supplement that contains live bacteria or yeast to supplement the normal GIT flora. So you haven't really had, um, what do you call it? You haven't had an antibiotic or you've had the antibiotic, but it didn't cause that much of a damage and you just want to boost or to increase the flora back to where it was and as a result they'll give you a probiotic so both prebiotic and probiotic are given to help your normal flora go back to normal and this is usually found in your yogurt and your amasi Okay, so gram staining. So gram staining is a staining technique for the preliminary identification of bacteria. So bacteria usually falls under two types, whether it's gram negative or gram positive. So for you to know if it's whether gram positive or gram negative, um, a violet dye is applied to the bacteria followed by a decolorizing agent and then a red dye is applied. So if the bacteria absorbs the violet dye and it turns purple or violet, it's gram positive. And if the bacteria appears pinkish, it's gram negative. And how you know this is a gram positive bacterium has got this layer, the purple parts here, but it lacks this outer membrane. So as a result, it will absorb all the violet dye. Whereas the gram negative, it's got this outer membrane, so it will absorb some of the violet dye and some of the red dye, and as a result, it appears pinkish. So that's how you know, and that's the reason why one appears violet and one appears pinkish. Okay, 
so microorganisms that antibiotics covers so as we're speaking about the spectrum these are the different bacteria that your antibiotics cover so you've got your gram positive your gram negative your pseudomonas your anaerobes your atypicals and MRSA. <clears throat> excuse me so gram positive examples would be your staphylococcus aureus streptococcus pneumonia and clostridium difficile or c diff so staphylococcus aureus is mostly found on your skin streptococcus pneumonia this is found in your lungs and clostridium c difficile this is found in your digestive system so as a result that's why when there's a bit of havoc with this one you get diarrhea and then your gram negative bacteria is your hemophilus influenza pseudomonas originosa e coli klebsiella etc and then obviously you can read through this so pretty much what this is just saying is when you give an antibiotic it will cover or it will either kill or inhibit these different types so if someone tells you that a type of antibiotic kills gram positive and gram negative bacteria it means that it's killing it can kill staphylococcus aureus bacteria streptococcus pneumonia etc etc so when you have a certain condition that is caused by that certain bacteria for example if a patient comes into the clinic they've got um, a chest issue they've been coughing and that sort of thing and you discover that they've been infected by the streptococcus pneumonia when you give them an antibiotic the antibiotic needs to be able to kill gram positive bacteria that's how you know that bacteria can be killed by this antibiotic so when you know what type of bacteria has infected the person this will help you to determine what type of antibiotic you're gonna use but this will make sense when i start giving you guys examples <clears throat> okay so antibiotic classes so pretty much this is the mechanism of action of your antibiotics so antibiotics fall under three categories it either causes cell wall synthesis inhibition or it causes protein synthesis inhibition or it causes dna or nucleotide synthesis inhibition so pretty much i'm pretty guys sure you guys got videos on this where it just told you how the different antibiotics work on the different bacteria you can look through that and see how it works but it's not really important you just need to know which antibiotic falls under which mechanism of action so when we have our cell wall synthesis inhibitors they stop the bacteria from creating the cell wall because an antibiotic wants to get to the nucleus of the bacteria because if you destroy the nucleus you have destroyed the bacteria so if you're stopping the cell wall from being built it makes it easier for the antibiotic to get to the nucleus and then we've got our protein synthesis inhibitors so when bacteria infects your body it starts creating proteins that are released in your body to infect more cells in your body so if you stop this protein synthesis you can stop the spread of the bacteria and then you've got your dna or nucleotide synthesis so obviously when you're making proteins you need dna nucleotides that's how you make proteins so obviously if you stop that process you also stop protein synthesis and as a result you stop the bacteria from becoming bigger and spreading etc etc so you can see that all these different antibiotics they work on different parts of the bacteria to either inhibit it or to kill it so examples penicillin cephalosporins vancomycin etc etc the also was in this you can look through this and know which antibiotic falls under which category the easiest way for me to remember the cell wall synthesis inhibitors is i use the phrase people call cops very much during the pandemic so people is penicillin call is cephalosporins cops is carbapenems very is vancomycin much is monobactams during is daptomycin and pandemic is polypeptides then the other three there's just extra ones that really didn't fit into this because majority of the time you'll be focusing on these because these are the ones that are prescribed the most 
and then we come to our protein synthesis inhibitors so we've got our macrolides and phenicols aminoglycosides linozolid lingosamides and tetracyclines and you can remember it by the phrase malt and then these ones you really you can create a creative one for yourself to remember them but the most important ones that you would need to know is your sulfonamides trimetroprene and quinolone and then your metronidazole Okay, cool. So we are starting with our cell wall synthesis inhibitors. So that means we are starting with the first list that we had, which was the people call very much, etc., etc. So first, the cell wall synthesis inhibitors, these are known also as your beta lactams, and we've already mentioned them. So the first one that we're going to start with is your penicillin. So penicillins, they cover your G-positive and your anaerobes. So your G-positive bacteria examples would be your Staphylococcus and your Streptococcus. And then you also have your anaerobes. So this is the spectrum of penicillins. And this is what it covers. So if it covered only one, which was G-positive or a gram-positive, it would be a narrow um, spectrum but since it covers two it's a broad spectrum you see other ones that actually cover more than three okay and then they are excreted by your kidneys so the reason why you need to know what is excreted with it is because if someone has renal failure that means they're not able to excrete penicillin because their kidneys are not working effectively. So you need to make sure that when you're giving the antibiotics, you also know the conditions that the patient has. Because if you give them penicillin and they've got renal failure, they will not be able to excrete that penicillin from their body and it will cause toxicity and cause many other side effects. So the main side effects of benzoyl penicillin is hypersensitivity. So you can have an anaphylactic reaction and and you can also have GI effects like diarrhea and it's a narrow spectrum. And then you've got procaine and benzathionine uh, penicillin. This is given IMI and then also it's got the same side effects of hypersensitivity and GI effect. And then you've got amoxicillin. Um, this is pretty much absorbed 85 percent orally so that means it can be given orally and it's good and it's also excreted in the kidneys same as your beans are penicillin so when you give being given amoxicillin you give it 500 milligrams eight hourly for five days so please make sure that they take it at the correct times to prevent the resistance and then it covers gram positive and some gram negative so it's an extended spectrum because it covers gram positive and then some gram negative side effects is gi so as you can see with most of these they cause gi effects and you need to avoid it in acute tonsillitis because it causes side effects and then we've got penicillin uh, with the big telectomase inhibitor Examples of this would be your core amoxiclav. So core amoxiclav is a combination of amoxicillin with clavulosinic acid, which is also known as augmentin. And its spectrum is G positive, G negative, and anaerobes. So as you can see, it's a broad spectrum. Okay. Um, but it causes more GI effects. So that's also another issue that you have because it's a broad spectrum. It kills more of the GI flora. So dosage would be 375 milligrams TDS three times a day for five days. So 375 milligrams, that means 250 milligrams is of the amoxicillin and then 125 milligrams if the, is of the clavulinic acid and then you need to give it at the start of a meal because it causes more gi effects so you must give it while you start eating so that there's food in the stomach while the antibiotic is being digested or being absorbed this is also help to prevent gi effects like diarrhea 
and vomiting. Then we've got what is known as peptides. So peptides is a combination of piperacillin and tazobactam, and its spectrum is pseudomonas, gram-positive, gram-negative, and anaerobe. As a result, this is a broad-spectrum antibiotic. And then we've got bictolactamase resistant penicillins. Examples would be your cloxacillin. This must be taken an hour before a meal or three hours after a meal. Um, this is because the meal affects its absorption and as a result you need to avoid giving it with meals. It is a drug of choice for cellulitis or osteomyelitis. Um, that are caused by staphylococcus infection. So staphylococcus infection is a gram positive, and as a result, the the, the spectrum of cloxacillin is gram positive infections. And then we've got flucloxacillin. This must be given on an empty stomach. So as you can see, both these two they must be given on an empty stomach because the presence of food in the stomach affects its absorption. And they're given for staphylococcus infections, which is your gram positive. Okay. So next, um, so we've done with penicillins. The next is our carbapenems. So the spectrum of carbapenems is gram positive, gram negative, pseudomonas, and anaerobes. So this is also a broad spectrum. And it's a second line treatment so what this means is when a patient comes in from the hospital when a patient comes into the hospital and they're being treated for an infection we've got first line treatment which is treatment that must be given for majority and can be given for pretty much anyone but sometimes patients will have certain conditions that will prevent them from being given a first line treatment for example we said that penicillins they are um, excreted in the kidneys but if the patient has got renal failure you can't give them penicillins therefore you need to go for a second line treatment so this is our second line treatment so carbapenems examples would be your lorocabef imipenem etapenem and rom meropenem so you can rem remember the penem <laughs> at the end and then this one is just an extreme one okay and then CRE, CRE is carbapenem resistant enterobacterium. So if you're giving carbapenems a lot, you can actually develop this type of resistance. So you must be very, very careful that you're not over prescribing it. Next, we've got vancomycin. So its spectrum is G positive and MRSA. So MRSA. So MRSA is a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So this is a resistant type of infection that patients would develop from being given way too much antibiotics. So vancomycin is one of the antibiotics that can be used to treat patients that have that type of resistance. And it's also a second line treatment. So Indications, it's given for those with severe infections such as MRSA, it's given for C. diff, and if it's C. diff, it's given orally, but majority of the time, it's given IV. But you must be careful when you're giving your IV, make sure that it's not um, being infused too quickly, because if it's in being infused too quickly, it causes what is known as the red man syndrome, which is pretty much it's similar to you having jaundice because it's being given too quickly, your skin starts absorbing it, and you have an orange tinge to your body. And then it's got a narrow therapeutic index. What this means is that um, it's highly likely to cause toxicity and then also you need to aware that it's auto and nephrotoxic so autotoxic means it can affect your ear and cause ear infections and can actually cause deafness and it's also nephrotoxic meaning it kills your nephrons in your kidneys so these are major major side effects an example of this would be your aminoglycosides also cause autotoxic and nephrotoxic and also if you're giving too much of vancomycin you can develop vancomycin resistant enterobacteria so it's very important that these two are not just being given randomly 
and people must finish their course to avoid developing these resistant strains of bacteria then the next type of cell wall synthesis inhibitor is your cephalosporins so they pretty much for four categories that fall under cephalosporins so first of all we've got our cephadroxyl cephalexin and cephazolin they all cover gram positive bacteria and then you've got your cefuroxim, cefoxetin, you know, all these cef. <laughs> um, they cover gram positive, some gram negative, and then also some anaerobe. So this is more broad spectrum than your first class. And then the third class is your ceftriaxone, cefixim, cefotexim, etc., etc. They cover gram positive, gram negative, and pseudomonas. And uh, these ones contain, and these mustn't be given with any calcium containing solutions, um, which is your self trigon because they cause side effects. And then you've got your fourth class, which is your Sevapim and Sevpyrome. These cover gram positive, gram negative, and pseudomonas. So, cephalosporins, they must be given IV. Adverse effects would be your hypersensitivity renal impairment, neurotoxicity in the elderly, and GI effects. So the main one that causes neurotoxicity in the elderly would be your cyprom, cyproflexin. Um, so please be aware that when this is being given to your patients, you need to check the age. So anyone above 65 should not be given cyproflexin, which falls under your cephalosporins. Okay, and then the last cell wall synthesis inhibitors. So polymyxins, these are given in your MDR and your XDR. So that's your multi-drug resistant and extreme drug resistant gram negative infections. So it's when your first line and your second line and sometimes even your third line treatment has not worked and this infection is just resistant to a number of different antibiotics. So they end up being given polymyxins. And then we've got your cholestin. This is given in your gram-negative gram and pseudomonas infections, and it's a third-line treatment. So this is given after you've received your penicillin, your carbapenems, your vancomycin, and your cephalosporins. So this is when you pretty much have no other choice. Um, it's not absorbed well in the GI, therefore it must be given IV. It's got a narrow... Um, therapeutic index meaning it's highly toxic and it's also a nephrotoxic so it causes effects to your kidneys so if someone has renal failure kidney failure please do not give them this one because it causes acute kidney injury and then you've got phosphomycin this is a gram positive and gram negative so that's the spectrum it's indicated for patients with utis mostly your females it must be given on an empty stomach two hours before a meal because meals affect its absorption cool so next we are going to our protein synthesis inhibitors so protein synthesis inhibitors is your microlides and phenicols aminoglycosides linozolid and lincosamide and your tetracycline so firstly we've got our macrolides these obviously they are attacking the protein synthesis process in the bacteria and their spectrum is gram positive gram negative anaerobes and atypicals so as you can see these macrolides they cover a bigger range of bacteria and therefore they are more broad spectrum and as a result they will have more side effects so you're going to see on my notes that this thing the 50s subunits and whatnot it's just pretty much the part of the protein synthesis process in the bacteria that it's affecting whether it's the 30s subunit or the 50s subunit so it's just a specific place in the bacteria that it's affecting but don't worry about it cool so different types of macrolides the most famous one is <clears throat> azithromycin but with azithromycin, you need to be cautioned. You can't give it in liver disease because obviously it's hepatotoxic, can cause liver damage, and then also 
causes GI effects and must be given once daily and you must take it with food. And this QT, it refers to the different waves that happens in your heart so your pqrs waves then you've got your qt region etc etc so it causes qt prolongations obviously it affects the contraction of your heart okay and then we've got azithromycin this must be given qid which is four times daily and it's got a high gi incidence so that means it causes a lot more gi effects and then we've got clarithromycin and roxithromycin these are given bd that means twice a day they've got a longer therapeutic index that's why they can be given only twice a day because it takes longer for them to be excreted from the body therefore they've got a longer effect in the body they've got a low gi incidence therefore they cause less frequent gi effect Okay, and then we've got our lincosamides. So they cover your G-positive anaerobes and atypicals. Example would be clindamycin. Um, this is used in Staphylococcus joint, bone, tissue, and soft tissue infections. Um, they cause C. diff. And the given orally, adverse effects would be obviously GI. For most of these, if it's given orally to cause GI effects, and it also causes ulcerative colitis, which is an intestine issue. Uh, it also causes severe hepatic impairment. It also causes porphyria, which is like a skin issue. So causes a whole lot of effects. So rather avoid giving this, especially to the older patients. Okay, and then we've got tetracyclines. These cover your G positive and G negative infections. Um, it's indicated for rickettsia, chlamydia infections, acne, malaria, prophylaxis. I will speak about this when we get to malaria. And then it chelates with milk or calcium iron substances. Pretty much what this means, it just causes the bunching up of any of those medications that contain calcium etc etc so therefore you need to avoid giving it with anything that's got calcium and iron in it side effects would be gi vestibular which is dizziness uh, pigmentation on the skin liver damage have sensitivity and a whole lot of resistance so this one is you know you must somewhat avoid it and then we've got example of tetracyclines would be doxycycline. This is given, it's contraindicated in pregnancy. It's a category D. I'll speak about this when we're speaking about malaria and also causes lactation issues. So women will have difficulty breastfeeding. So therefore it must be given to pregnant women and also affects children and older people. So therefore you need to avoid those type of groups. And then it's given 200 milligrams daily or 100 milligrams. I mean, it's given 200 milligrams on day one and then 100 milligrams for five days after. You must take it without food with lots of water and in an upright position. And then we've got our amino glycosides. They cover G positive and pseudomonas. They have got a synergistic effect with penicillin. So that means they can be combined with penicillins to give a better effect. Um, and then we've got um, the given IMI. They've got a narrow therapeutic index. Um, as a result, they're autotoxic and nephrotoxic. So please take note of all these ones that are nephrotoxic and autotoxic they're gonna ask you questions on these majority of the time and then rarely it causes muscle paralysis so please be aware when giving patients such medications examples of these would be kenamycin and amikacin these are usually given in mdr tb and then we've got gentamycin streptomycin nettlemycin and tobramycin so yeah aminoglycosides anything with the mycin in it except for your clandamycin. <laughs> okay. And then we've got chloramphenicol. This covers your G-positive and G-negative infections. And it goes to the um, 
spinal fluid um, so therefore it's used in meningitis and recursia then in the eyes used for bacterial conjunctivus and it causes a plastic anemia bone marrow depression and a gray baby syndrome so a plastic anemia is a type of anemia because it affects the bone marrow so therefore it's destroying the red the immature red blood cells that are there and as a result it will cause anemia and that's why it causes a syndrome called gray baby syndrome because you do not have enough red blood cells because they're being killed by the antibiotic therefore the baby will not appear pink they'll be very pale then you've got fusidic acid this covers gram positive and MRSA this is a steroid antibiotic. Um, it's well absorbed into the bone, but the adverse effect is that it call, it's hepatotoxic, meaning it affects your liver. So all these ones that are circled, please take note of their side effects. They're very important. And then we've got linozolid. This causes... This covers gram-positive anaerobes and MRSA. It's a second, third-line antibiotic. Um... It's broad spectrum and it's yeah, it's broad spectrum and used in organisms that are resistant to cloxacillin and vancomycin. It's indicated for complicated skin and soft tissue infections and thirty five percent of it is excreted in the urine. So you need to be aware of this, especially in patients with um, kidney failure. Adverse effect is that it causes myelosuppression anemia. Since it can go into soft tissue, it can affect the bone marrow and cause some form of anemia. All right, then we've got our DNA or nucleotide synthesis inhibitors. So these are antibiotics that affect the DNA synthesis in the bacteria and stop it from spreading any further. So first we've got our sulfonamides and trimetropin. Um, these are toxic and as a result will cause hypersensitivity. Examples of this would be silver sulfadiazin. This is a topical treatment for leg ulcers, burn wounds, pressure sores. But the side effects is obviously it causes hypersensitivity, local burning and itching since the Areas that it's used are open. And then we've got sulfur salicin. This is used in ulcerative colitis, which is an intestine issue. Um, but it's poorly absorbed in the GI. And as a result, the side effects include headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and photosensitivity. And it's contraindicated in any gastric or duodenal ulcers. Since it, it's given orally, if you give it where there's an ulcer, it will be absorbed in that area and it will cause major, major issues. And then we've got sulfur cetamide. This is given in bacterial conjunctivus, which is in your, an eye infection. Side effects would obviously be irritation to the eye and contraindicated in anyone with headaches. And then combination, when you combine sulfur methoxazole and trimetropium, you get what is known as cord trimoxazole or also known as Bactrim. This is a prophylactic treatment that is given to HIV patients to prevent them from getting other opportunistic infections. Since um, they are immunosuppressed and immunocompromised, they are highly likely to get many other infections. And as a result, they are given this in addition to their treatment until their viral load goes down. And the last one is quinolone this is a an interesting one is used in special circumstances this happens when you have a beta lactam allergy uh pretty much when you're allergic to your penicillin your cephalosporins your carbapenem so pretty much any cell wall synthesis medications if you're allergic to any of those you'll get quinolone or if the first line treatment has failed, then you'd be given quinolone. It's indicated for MDR, TB, and pretty much it can be combined with macrolides and it will be a synergistic effect. Example of this would be your 
fluoroquinolones. Adverse effects is GI and joint pain, aortic aneurysm, disturbed vision, and CNS. So as a result, this should be the last thing that you give a patient because of the effects that are very high. Drug interactions is a chelating agent. So like I mentioned, if it's given with anything that's got calcium or iron in it, it causes it to bunch up and it can actually cause... um what do you call it embolism so it's contraindicated in pregnancy pregnant women in growing children because of the joint pain and the disturbed vision issues and it can cause spontaneous tendon rupture this is a big one that you need to know with fluoroquinolones so as a result you need to avoid giving this medication as much as possible rather try your other first or second or even your third line treatment before you come to your chloroquinolones and since it's given orally the absorbed ed is decreased by antacids so obviously if your patient is taking an any any antacid and then they take this medication it actually decreases its absorption and it will not work as well okay and then we've got your nitrofurantoin this is given in utis um, and then you need to take it with food or milk so that you, have, you avoid the GI effects or decrease the intensity of them. And it's excreted in the kidney. Therefore, you need to watch out if the patient has any kidney issues. Side effects is obviously GI effects, headaches, hepatotoxic. Therefore, you need to watch out for liver issues and peripheral neuro toxic then we've got metronidazole example would be this would be your nitrometazole derivative its spectrum is gram positive and gram negative it's indicated for anaerobic infections necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis um, which is pretty much an issue in the mouth caution mustn't give it to patients with epilepsy cns diseases impaired hepatic function um, blood issues, which is this one, pregnancy, those that are breastfeeding, older people. So pretty much you're avoiding a wide range of people. Side effects would be nausea, anorexia, headache, GI effects. It's got a metallic taste to it. And you need to avoid alcohol 48 hours after getting this medication because it can actually cause some CNS issues. Um, causes discoloration of the urine, so you need to be aware of this should any of your patients have it. Dosage would be 400 milligrams 8 hourly for 5 to 7 days, and it's known as flagell. Side effects, nausea, vomiting, flushing, sweating, and abdominal cramps. So with all of these, please take note of the ones that are hepatotoxic, autotoxic, nephrotoxic, those are very very important because you need to make sure that your patients do not have any of those conditions because if you give it to them you can actually cause more harm to them than was necessary so these are your antibiotics next we're going to go to your antivirals and then we're going to focus a bit on malaria